I appreciate all of you for uh, coming here today. I want to uh, thank you for um, attending on the behalf of the Robotics Institute, which is housed at the University of Toronto. Um, I wish to acknowledge this, the land on which University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, today, this meeting place is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, I'm thrilled today to have two guests from Health Canada. Uh, I'm, first, I'm going to introduce Jade, and then I will introduce uh, Gregory after Jade's presentation is over. And then after they both uh, finish presenting, we'll have plenty of time for your questions. Uh, so Jade Bateau is an expert in stakeholder engagement of the Medical Devices Directorate of Health Canada. Uh, she holds a master's degree in biochemistry from Pierre and Marie Curie University in Paris. Uh, she joined the Medical Devices Directorate in 2016 and most recently led the COVID-19 team. Uh, she, before that, was the supervisor of the medical devices licensing section, responsible for managing license applications, overseeing and coordinating regulatory activities with the various scientific review groups, in addition to, develop, to developing SOPs guidelines to ensure quality and efficiency of regulatory processes. I'm so excited for you to share your information with us. Uh, please take it away, Jade. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. Yeah, uh, so hi, everyone. So even if I don't see many faces, but I see, I'm able to see names. So nice to meet with everyone today. Uh, so I can go ahead and start my presentation. Uh, just need to share my screen, just a second. I'll go to screen two. So you can hear me properly. Just show with hands. You need to make sure. Okay. Great. You so, go. Yeah. So you you see my screen. Okay. Thank you. So uh, welcome everyone. So today's presentation is meant to provide you with an overview of the Health Canada regulatory framework. Uh, by regulatory framework, we refer to our guiding principles when processing medical devices, when classifying medical devices in their appropriate classification or classes, and any additional regulatory information pertaining to authorizing, assessing, scientific reviewing uh, medical devices before being sold in the Canadian market. Uh, next slide. So before we jump in into the content of the presentation, it is important to walk you through uh, the, the topics we will be covering. So the first item will be to get you aware or informed on who we are and what we do. Then we move on to the stakeholder engagement topic. This reflects all of the various organizations we interact with externally, mostly, and for what purpose. Uh, the core element of the presentations is in item number three, which is relevant to our regulatory processes. So we rely on regulatory tools to, to do our work, how we classify medical devices and uh, how we process uh, license applications toward license issuance, rejection or license amendment. Finally, we wanted to share with you some information on our process improvement. Uh, a process improvement uh, refer, refers to changes uh, that could be relevant to uh, license submissions or any educating or informing stakeholder engagement tool. So who we are as a medical devices director, as an entity of Health Canada, and what are roles and responsibilities? So uh, we, we are divided up into five bureaus and uh, a general office. We have a Bureau of Licensing Services, 
uh, that deals with the uh, processing license applications. By this, I am referring to regulatory screening of license applications before they get moved to scientific review. We also have a Bureau of Investigational Testing. So this bureau is responsible for authorizing devices that are intended to be used for clinical research on humans. In addition to providing expedited access to medical devices that are not yet authorized in Canada. So if we don't have a device that we uh, healthcare professionals needed to use, but we don't have it in the Canadian market because the manufacturer is not interested with the Canadian market, we can request an expedited authorization just for one unit of that device that might be authorized in other by other regulatory uh, agencies like the US FDA, the TGA in, in Australia, the European Union agency. We also have a Bureau of Evaluation where you might fit. So this Bureau is, has five scientific review sections. So we have the digital health sections. We have Greg here from that division today. We have the cardiovascular division. We have the musculoskeletal division uh, and the, the general restorative division. I think we lost Jade. Oh, she's back. You have to unmute yourself. You're muted. Please pardon our technical difficulties. Yeah, so sorry for that. Uh, and uh, the, the fifth bureau is the Bureau of Policy and International Programs responsible for interacting with the other regulatory agencies for developing and implementing guidance document and policies. Oh, Jade, Jade, you may want to share your screen again. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. Screen two. Can you see it now? Okay, thank you. Uh, who are our stakeholders? When we talk about stakeholders, we think they are just industry, medical devices, manufacturers, but it's not the case. Even if for the most part, we deal with manufacturers because we authorize devices that are meant to be sold in the Indian market, but we do interact with other types of stakeholders who are medical devices importers, medical devices distributors, healthcare professionals, researchers, universities and colleges, and with patients, with the public in general, medical devices users. So we, we keep to maintain an open communication. We help uh, medical devices manufacturers to classify medical devices before they can submit a license application to make sure they follow the right licensing pathway. So our main stakeholder activities involve outreach sessions uh, webinars, roundtables, discussions with medical devices industry or their representatives, associations, and healthcare professionals representative to uh, patient advocacy groups. We also look for more engagement opportunities for improving our regulatory processes and uh, keep them informed of any changes to uh, to the regulations. So in addition to that, Health Canada publishes information to help Canadian, Canadians more informed and make the best choice when choosing a medical devices when, or when they interact with a healthcare professional for a medical device usage. So uh, currently Health Canada, uh, I mean, uh, discuss 
uh, more, mostly with uh, the industry th through pilot meetings uh, and uh, on our regulatory changes, in addition to our interaction and discussion through committee meetings with the other regulatory agencies. What are our regulatory tools to do our work in a fair, consistent ways? So we rely on three, or I may say four, uh, regulatory tools. So we have those, we have the Food and Drugs Act, we have the medical devices regulations, and we have the guidance documents and policies. Uh, the Food and Drug Act identifies the prohibition that apply to devices sold in Canada, anything that cannot be done. So for example, manufacturers cannot advertise or represent to the general public devices that are uh, that for, the, uh, for conditions that belong to what we call Schedule A diseases that may involve cancer, depression, dementia. This is just one part. It's a, a tiny part of the Food and Drugs Act. We also have the medical devices regulations, which is a subset of the Food and Drugs Act. So the, it focuses on medical devices, on uh, it, so it regulates the licensing process, the inspections, and the importation and distribution activities. In addition to uh, authorizing clinical clinical studies, the guidance documents provide information on classify, classification of medical devices, uh, how to complete a license application, or how to submit uh, an investigational testing authorization, in addition to special access to uh, unlicensed me medical devices. So uh, here is, uh, I outlined what are the parts and schedules uh, we find in the medical devices uh, regulations. So we have five parts with three schedules. So part one refers to definitions, licensing requirements, and uh, who are our regulat regulated parties, sorry. <coughs> By regulated parties, we refer to industry, who are medical devices manufacturers, importers, and distributors, and, and uh, regulated parties that submit uh, authorization authorizations for clinical studies. We, in part two, we have custom-made devices and medical devices to be imported or sold for, for special access. Part three uh, refers to clinical studies, the process, how we, how we, how we authorize uh, clinical research on a human uh, subject. Uh, up until now, we authorize a device to be used in a clinical research. But we have a new regulation that is posted online. It's in consultation where we will be authorizing a clinical research rather than a device. This is to be able to monitor a device through its life cycle. So we, we wanted to line up, I mean, th this, uh, as we do for drugs. We don't, we will not authorize a device, but a clinical research. We also have part four for exportation, part five for provisions, repair, or any coming into force to cancel a license or part of the license. In schedules, we have the classification system. So we have various rules on how to classify medical devices. Schedule two is for anything that is implants and schedule three is for exportation of medical devices from Canada. So how we define a medical device. So we have a device that is defined by the Food and Drugs Act. So this refers to any instrument apparatus that is used to diagnose, treat, 
or restore, modify a body structure or function, anything that prevents or diagnose a pregnancy in human beings or animals uh, or prevent conception, for example. This is this applies to a device, but when we come to a medical device, it has to be applicable to human only. So we have the same definition, but it has to be for human only as per the medical devices regulations. Uh, just to move on to the next slide, sorry. Uh, so we have in part one of the medical devices regulations, how we define uh, our regulated parties who are manufacturers, importers, and distributors of medical devices. Uh, so a manufacturer is defined as uh, could be a person or a company that is responsible for designing, manufacturing, owning a trade name of a medical device, and also responsible for labeling a device, refurbishing or packaging. An importer is responsible for the medical devices being brought into Canada for sale. A distributor is a person rather than a manufacturer and importer who sells a medical device in Canada for the purpose of resale or use, other than for, for personal use. All these definitions are in part one of the medical devices regulations, as I just mentioned earlier. So, uh, our medical devices classification system uh, the divides medical devices in two categories. So we have the medical devices uh, that are used in labs, in hospitals, or in clinics that are named in vitro diagnostic devices. Those, the, the, or we call them IVDDs. Uh, so those devices refer to medical devices that are intended to be used in vitro for the examination of specimens taken from the human body. So any urine sample, blood sample, tissues, anything that is intended to be used in a lab is called, refers to in vitro diagnostic devices. In the, on the other side, we have the medical devices that are not in vitro diagnostic devices. So those devices are intended to come into contact with the human body. So anything that fits the definition of the medical device, but that is not IVDD are grouped in what we call non in vitro diagnostic devices. What are all the, class, the classes for medical devices? So uh, medical devices are classified into one of classes one to four, one, two, three, four, uh, by means of the classification rules set out in schedule one of the medical devices regulations. So within this classification, we have class one that represents the lowest risk of, and the class four, that you represent the higher risk. The risk classification of a device depends on uh, different factors. So we have the level on, of invasiveness, the duration of contact in the body, or the source of energy that is used in a device. So multiple uh, determinants are used to classify a device as per the medical devices regulations. Uh, we have class one, for example, we have a reusable surgical instrument, hospital beds. All these are low risk devices. For class two, we have blood pressure monitors. Uh, we have contact lenses. We have uh, pregnancy tests. Those, those are uh, home use devices. And we also have electrical toothbrush, which is a class two device. For class three and four, they, they are high, high risk classes. We have dental implants, defibrillators. Class four, we can list pacemakers, COVID-19 detection kits. All these are class four devices. 
Uh, so here I have listed what are the classification rules for non in vitro diagnostic devices. So for example, any invasive device fall under rule one, two, three. We have rule one, rule two, depending on what they detect, what their intended use. So we classify a device based on the, its indication for use. We have, a, have listed here all the devices that are invasive, uh, surgical sutures or examination gloves. We have non-invasive devices that uh, fall under rules four to seven. We have bandages, uh, oxygen masks. Uh, the, we have wheelchairs. Uh, we also have active devices. Active devices are devices that use energy to operate. So we have x-ray machines, we have uh, cardiac defibrillators, ventilators used in ICU units. Uh, and we have special rules for devices that do not fall under any of these rules. So you ha we have breast implants, bone graft, we have uh, medical devices, sterilizers. Those are the machines intended to sterilize medical devices. They are class two devices themselves. For in vitro diagnostic devices that use human samples to diagnose, uh, we have the ones that fall under rule one, two, three for transmissible agents. We have the one that uh, other anything that other than transmissible agents, we have rule one, four, and five, and we have special rules that fall under from rules six to nine. So we, we have any near patient IVDDs like pregnancy or fertility uh, test kits. They are class two devices, even if they are home use devices. Any home use device is a class three, but for pregnancy and fertility tests, they are, they are class twos. Uh, so all these are examples of the devices and under what classification rule they fall. Uh, so uh, as a real world examples for robotic devices, we have, I have brought up uh, two existing licenses for those devices. So we have the GEO system, which is a robotic assisted therapy system. It is a class two device, is used for rehabilitation. This, for example, this device is fall under rule 10. What is rule 10 in the part in schedule one of the medical devices regulations? It's any device, it's an active device including any dedicated software that supplies energy for the purpose of imaging, monitoring physiological processes fall under class two. So this is just a typical example of robotic device. In, besides that, we have other robotic devices. Those devices are are intended to assist the surgeon to precisely control surgical instrument. Their classification, because most of the part, they, they are licensed within the entire system. So their classification follow the same classification of the system, the entire system. It's licensed as a system license. If the system is a class four, those devices follow a class four. It takes the, the entire system classification. So we have a license, you can look it up yourself online. Uh, it's a license 97378. It's for the Da Vinci system. Just if you are curious to see what type of, or you, you can look it up online to see what are these devices. We have, in terms of licensing, we have two types of licensing at Health Canada, depending on the device risk class. So, so we have the class one devices that are low risk devices that, that are authorized through establishment licensing process. And within a separate division from our directorate. So we have at Health Canada, which is called the Medical Device Establishment Licensing Unit, responsible for authorizing class one devices. 
besides that, we have our uh, bureau, licensing bureau responsible for licensing class two, three, and four medical devices, because those devices, they don't follow the same licensing pathway like class one. Uh, so we have what we call medical device license is applicable to class two, three, and four, anything that high risk, that is a high risk. And we have the MDEL, which is medical est device establishment license. This is intended for authorizing class one device or importation and distribution of any device class one, two, three, or four. This is the nuance between both. In terms of regulatory uh, licensing process, what so the manufacturers are accountable to supply all these documents to have their devices authorized in the Canadian market. This, this pathway is applicable to class two, three, and four medical devices. So they they supply an application form, a medical device license application form. They supply, they have to supply a, med a medical device labeling where we have to find a medical device name, a manufacturer information, a device uh, identifier, and the indication for use, which, which is also the most important part of the device label. They have also to supply a quality management certificate, which is uh, uh, which is uh, the ISO 13485. Uh, this is to confirm that the device is designed and manufactured, manufactured following this ISO. And it has to be MDSAP uh, certified, which is the medical device single audit program. In addition to these three parts, they have to pay fees. So the fee is dependent to the, the risk of the device. Plus we go to class four, the fee might go up to 10,000 per license for class four device, depending whether it's in vitro or non in vitro device. Class two devices, they are up to 500 per file. In addition to that for class threes and four, even two, they have to supply what we call a regulatory dossier where we can find scientific or the scientific information about the device itself. Any testing, any clinical research data, any uh, marketing information in other regulatory uh, jurisdiction. So we ask for this regulatory dossier. This is applicable to class three and four medical devices uh, license application, not for class two. For class two, the manufacturer has to have the regulatory dossier, but they don't have to submit it to Health Canada unless it's requested. For some, time, for some types of devices, we do request the regulatory dossier. We do request scientific information just to make sure the device that is being sold in the Canadian market is safe and effective for just a small part of class twos. How we process license applications. So we receive license applications by email in a zipped file. So uh, it has to follow what we name the, the table of content. So we receive the application. The application, it goes to regulatory screening to make sure we have the quality management certificate. We have the application form and we have the device label. And when we find the, the I mean, the, the file is complete from regulatory perspective, we move the file to scientific review for class threes and four. However, for class two, unless requested by uh, the scientific division, we don't move them to scientific review because they are considered low risk devices. So what are the regulatory, so, so we can issue a license, we can reject a file at the regulatory screening or at the, the scientific review stage. Uh, at this time, we don't have regulatory provision for refund. So if a file is under scientific review and we reject a file, 
the manufacturers are, don't get any refunds. So just so that you know. Uh, we, we also deal with timelines for one licensing, one processing license application. So for example, we have 15 calendar days to process a class two license application. We have 65 days for class three and 75 days for class four. But again, sometimes we always have, because we, we give manufacturer manufacturers uh, the right to be heard. So we also go back to them to supply the missing information through additional information requests or through regulatory deficiencies emails. That's how the way it works. Uh, so how we receive files. All manufacturers are committed to follow specific guidance for uh, presenting license application in a format that is named the table of contents, which is, we, we name it more commonly TOC. So in the TOC, we will find the regulatory admin information, we will find the, the labeling information, and each section has a specific document that the uh, manufacturer is accountable to supply that section unless it's not applicable. So uh, the, the license applications uh, may come in a zip folder through email or through a CD or DVD if it's up to uh, 20 megabytes. So it is expected that the use of uh, this harmonized format, because it, it, the TOC format is used by other regulatory agencies, like, uh, uh, I mean, foreign agencies. Uh, it, it reduces the time for both us and manufacturers when we receive, uh, I mean, all license applications in, within the same format. Uh, a new, uh, a new uh, submission pathway, which is called the Electronic Submission Gateway. This is uh, at uh, pilot project stage is used by the US FDA. So we receive uh, files through uh, a portal, then it can, the file comes. So in, uh, with this, it's like an online submission like we do for our uh, uh, insu insurance, we manufacturers, they need to, to register and have a username and password. They can, they can follow the, uh, the, the steps of their uh, file review. Uh, they don't have to come to us each time or phone us to ask, where is my file is, uh, I mean, this is to, to it's, it's a more saving time for both us and manufacturers to monitor the, the license application process. That's, uh, that's the objective of it. It's not, uh, I mean, it's used for a few, uh, by a few, few manufacturers because it, as I mentioned earlier, is just a pilot project, but is widely used by the US FDA. So uh, this is uh, another key element for dynamic changes in addition to the TOC and the GS, uh, the, the gateway uh, for process improvement. So this is an e-learning course designed for students, for researchers, for industry. So the, it's, it provides education on our licensing process, on our classification, system and in each section of the course you will find educational materials like web pages that refers to specific topics for license submissions license amendments fees timelines i mean all this information so if you have not yet done i invite you to sign up it's within the health canada website you are welcome to I mean, to register and have the, com and complete the course. Uh, this is just a useful information I wanted to share with you because I was, 
Uh, I had been fully involved in processing COVID-19 license applications. So in terms of our achievement for licensing, we received around 12,000 license applications and amendments per year. This number is divided up into around 70% for class twos, 23% for class threes, and 4% for high risk devices, which are class four devices. In addition to licensing medical devices that are not COVID-19 devices, we also have been involved because it, we are continuing licensing COVID-19 devices. So since March 2020, Health Canada has authorized 644 devices used in relation to COVID-19. So th those devices include medical masks, gloves, gowns, detection kit, COVID-19 detection kits, ventilators, syringes, and thermometers. So I have here a table of devices that are have been authorized for uh, COVID-19 detection, coronavirus detection. So all these are in vitro diagnostic devices. They might be antigen testing devices, nucleic acid testing, serological testing. So the total is uh, 61 devices. So I have added here two in important information to our medical device license database. You are welcome to look at this database and search for licenses by device name or manufacturer's name. So you have uh, many uh, searches you can go through to find a device that, uh, I mean, if you are curious to look at it. In addition to the medical device active license listing, we have the a, a database for authorized medical devices used in relation to COVID-19. So uh, I can share my PowerPoint presentation with Kimberly. You are welcome to share it with everyone just to look, to have the, these links available to everyone in addition to the earning, the e-learning course. So we, I have provided our uh, email, uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the medical devices web, the medical devices directorate website, because I know the Health Canada website is a maze of information, you will get lost after a few minutes. So this uh, prompts you directly to the, the medical devices directorate, our email and our phone number. So uh, thank you for your attention. This is, these are my last words. Uh, I wrap up my presentation with a reminding everyone to prepare your questions if you have so, uh, and I would be happy to discuss any items. So, et j'invite aussi les francophones si vous avez des questions, if we have francophones here. So, uh, uh, je serais ravie uh, d'apporter des clarifications. Merci, thank you. Merci. Uh, thank you so much for all of that wonderful information. Um, I'm going to ask the audience to please go ahead and hold your questions until after Gregory is presented, and then we'll we'll get to them. But if you would like to put them in the chat now so that you don't forget, please feel free to do that. Um, so turning to Gregory, uh, Greg Jackson has a background in electrical engineering from the University of Ottawa and clinical engineering from the University of Toronto. He's previously worked with a surgical robots robotics distributor as a technical and clinical representative for the da Vinci surgical robots platform. We've uh, definitely heard a lot about that at a number of hospitals across Ontario. Um, after some time that he spent in Alberta as a data analyst and engineer for an energy exploration company, uh, he is now back in Ottawa and works as a scientific evaluator for the digital health technologies division of the medical devices directorate at Health Canada. Um, which, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand is a new division. So Greg will tell us all about that. And with that, I turn it over to Greg. Hi, everyone. Um, I will try to share my screen so that it pops up. Just let me know if this is working. Perfect. Okay. 
Yeah, so as Kimberly said, my name is Greg Jackson. I'm with the Digital Health Division. You can see there's sort of a long web of uh, so sections up to Health Canada, but we're part of the Medical Devices Directorate. And so we'll start starting out. Uh, so medical devices are typically a response to a medical need. And there's a lot of steps that go into the development of them from first concept to planning, development, verification, validation. Then it gets to the submit and approve phase, which is where we come in. And we'll go a little more in depth into that. So Jade gave a pretty good overview of the of Health Canada and the medical devices directorate. We're in the health products and food branch. And my team, the digital health team, is in the Bureau of Device Evaluation. And there's a few other teams that focus on cardiovascular devices, on musculoskeletal devices, uh, in vitro diagnostic, and then general and restorative, which sort of covers everything that doesn't fit into those other umbrellas. And the, the Bureau, there's about 65 people who are trained as biologists, chemists, engineers, physicists, um, foreign trained doctors, retired surgeons, and all, all kinds of expertise in the medical devices field. The digital health, as Kimberly said, is fairly new. It was formed about three years ago and it was created to advance and adapt regulatory approaches to respond to emerging technologies and a lot more devices using software and software as medical devices and increasing AI and machine learning in devices. So our group, we assess the safety and effectiveness of diagnostic imaging devices, radiotherapy and radiation emitting devices, laser devices. And we do a lot of work now in things like mobile medical apps, wireless medical devices, medical device interoperability, 3D printing software, AI and machine learning, and cybersecurity. So I, I won't go too deep into the risk classes because Jade went over those quite well, but yeah, as, as she discussed, the devices will go from class one up to class four. Most of our reviews are in the class three and class four realm. And my team is a lot of class three devices. Um, in your class threes, you'll see things like ultrasound and laser and some surgical navigation systems and then up to your class fours where you'll see certain surgical devices like the da Vinci system which a surgical device that does procedures that involve cardiovascular or neurological systems will go into class four because it's a higher risk thing there, there are surgical navigation systems that say work only on knee surgeries and because that's considered a lower risk then you'd have that in a class three type license um and where are we here? So what do we need to look at when we're evaluating medical device applications? Um, the medical device regulations are split into five parts. We primarily look in evaluation at the first three parts and for typical licenses, specifically in part one. And there's a section of it that looks at basically the, the risk and benefits of devices uh, with respect to safety and effectiveness in particular. So effectiveness will have to do with the intended use of the device. Most class three and four devices have an explicit intended use or indications for use, and we need to see enough evidence that the device can achieve its intended use in its intended population of use. And then safety, safety is a bit of a spectrum and involves some risk benefit. For example, a device that might be life-saving or critical in diagnosing or treating serious conditions may have a little bit of leeway in terms of if if it has some mild biocompatibility concerns or something for example whereas something like a tattoo removal laser for just to throw out an example really needs to have a high safety profile because the, the benefits are sort of very particular and be hard to argue that they're necessarily life-saving or life critical in that case and so we see, so this is the sort of dossier that we'll see documentation in support of a class three license. There's a couple of different structures. This is sort of the current typical one that's on Health Canada's website. And we'll go through each of the sections that we look at, which is primarily in the 
kind of pre-market and safety and effectiveness sections. And I'll, I'll go over those a little bit more as we go forward. There's some additional documentation we require in support of a class four license because they're higher risk devices. So we get a little more interested in things like manufacturing and quality control and material specifications, process validation, things for these particular high risk devices that really require some additional information. So first up is our device description, which is what is the device? What does it do? What, is it, what does it treat? How does it work? What is it made from? Some general performance specifications, say for a laser, we'd wanna know how powerful is it? What's its wavelength? What's the, what's the frequency it operates at? Things of that nature what materials are used in the device, especially those that come in contact with the patient or the user. Um, so here there's you know, a decent picture of the Da Vinci surgical system, for example. You, you have the major components, you have some information on some of the instruments that are used. And if, if there's a number of instruments, say with a device, and we'll wanna know each of those, what the differences are between them and whether the device uh, is compatible with other licensed devices and how and whether they're required for its use or just additional to its use. And we look at a new versus amendment application. So an amendment is a device that's already licensed, but there are changes being made. And we look at what we call significant changes require a full amendment application. And significant is, again, kind of something that would be new in terms of safety and effectiveness that we haven't fully reviewed before. Like if they're changing the color of the cover on a device, that's not a significant change. It may have a new device identifier. And so they would submit kind of a, a brief application. But if they're adding a new instrument or changing the software or they want to use it for a new intended use, then those are significant changes. And we look take a full look at the safety and effectiveness of the device and make sure everything works as as it's intended to and next slide here design philosophy is something we look at um what is the device based on something that already exists and how how does it work what is it trying to treat what's the sort of underlying mechanism of action Depending on the device, so for, for a novel device or something that's treating something that hasn't been treated often before, we may need a fair bit of information on this. For something that's a pretty well-established technology, and I'll, I'll use diagnostic ultrasound because I've reviewed a lot of those, we, we understand generally how that works. So unless they're kind of reinventing how, how they're doing the diagnostic ultrasound, th this section may be a little short for something like that, we'll say it, it works as most other ultrasound devices do. Um, then labeling is covered in sections 21 to 23 of part one of the medical device regulations. So the licensing section will take a look at sort of all the individual device labels and look at requirements like unique identifier, manufacturer's name, things like that. In the scientific review, we're looking a little bit more at the instruction manuals, at the technical guides, at advertising to an extent. Um, so we, we want to see, so in, intended use or indications for use should be present unless it's self-evident to the user. And some of the intended uses can be pretty general. It's a CT scanner may say the intended use is to perform CT scans of, of patients, whereas for an ultrasound, for example, we'll have like this individual probe is used for abdominal scans only when connected to this device. So it can get very specific or very general depending on what's required. And we wanna see instructions that will allow the user to safely and effectively use the device depending on how complicated it is, depending on what it's treating, depending on who's using it. And there's sort of a, a range of what we would require in the labeling. And that's something we can ask for revisions on or changes in or specific requirements and say, this is only available for this use in Canada. These kind of things do come up at times. And advertising will look at kind of claims. As Jade said, there's some things in the Medical Devices Act that in, in the Food and Drugs Act where they're not allowed to say that they treat certain conditions. And, but, and other things, if it says it's, 
you know, 10, 10 times more powerful than some other device, we'll, we'll want to see proof of that. Or more, if they have numerical claims, we may need to see proof of that depending on what they are. Marketing history, we look at if, if the device has been on the market elsewhere, say the US or Europe, we were interested in how many of them have sold, how, for how long they've been on the market, whether there've been any recalls or, or adverse events. And if so, what have the manufacturer done to correct for those or adjust for those? And if the device is completely new, then we may look at similar devices and then we can say, these devices have had this kind of issue. How have you looked at managing this kind of issue? So next, a uh, list of standards is something that's pretty common, especially for the devices we see in digital health. It's not absolutely required, but it's usually useful. They can say, they can show that they've conformed to say electrical safety, electromagnetic compatibility standards and things like that. And if they, if these are, these are well-known international standards like IEC 60601, and then there's ISO standards, which we see a lot for biocompatibility and some other things. Health Canada has a published list of recognized standards, which the manufacturers can look at and kind of pick from the ones that are applicable to their device that they've actually tested to or designed towards. And depending on the standard, sometimes we'll take their signed declaration of conformity. Sometimes we require the test reports to see some additional information, but it, it really depends on the standard and the device type. A risk assessment is required for a class four device. It's not always required for a class three device. Sometimes we will ask for it, but it, it can be useful for it just to be provided. Uh, ISO 14971 is a common um, standard for medical device risks. And the manufacturer will sort of look at what hazards exist, uh, what situation will bring them about um harm based on the severity and the probability of occurrence and then they'll put in mitigations for each of those hazards and kind of verified proof that they have mitigated those to as low a level as possible or show that the that the remaining risk is outweighed by the benefit of the device and again this, this depends a lot on what the device does what it is what the remaining risks are and and not and we'll look we'll look through the risk assessments and try and ensure that they've uh, they've considered the risks that we that we feel are important and that they've shown that they've actually put in mitigations and tested those mitigations to ensure that they're actually in place. And we get to safety and effectiveness, which is sort of the the remainder that so the previous sections kind of will go under context and then we have um, an, uh, the studies and reports that they'll submit to verify the safety and effectiveness. So a quick uh, word on verification and validation, which comes up a lot in software, but can apply to other types of testing too. Um, so verification more or less means, did you de design the device correctly? Does it meet the output requirements? So it's sort of going step by step and making sure that everything works properly. And validation is, did you design the right device? sort of a higher level of testing and does it overall do what you want it to do? So a real world example, um, if you wanna to drive to the beach, you put your destination into Google Maps. Verification would be going step by step and saying, turn right onto this street, merge onto this street. Can you follow each of these directions? Validation happens when you arrive and get out of the car. Are you at the beach or did you end up at the grocery store? So one, you know, one way is validated and one way didn't end up where you wanted to go. Um, so bench tests, bench tests can cover a lot of things. These are, these are sort of typical ones for digital health devices. For groups like musculoskeletal, they'll have things like mechanical stress tests and different things. We, we will typically see tests more like measurement accuracy. So if, if labeling says that this, you know, this can measure length to plus or minus one millimeter, we want to see proof of that. Registration accuracy, say in a surgical navigation system, if if an, if there's if you have an optical tracking system, you want to show that it's tracking something accurately, especially if you're doing a delicate surgery. Output accuracy would be something like laser or RF output or ultrasound output. You want to see that 
if if you say it's at a certain wavelength that it is indeed at that wavelength dose for things like radiation devices you want to see that the dose profile is what you expect and is within kind of safe limits thermal harm testing is something we see health canada has a guidance on this for especially therapeutic and cosmetic devices that use laser or rf or things their mechanism of action is typically heating the tissue but we want to see that it doesn't overheat the tissue and cause burns so we'll and so for laser devices for example they interact differently with different shades of skin tone so if they say they can treat all shades of skin tone we need to see testing and show that they don't burn any of those skin tones at their kind of output powers. Human factors and usability testing can be required, especially for novel devices and you know things like robotic systems. You want to sort of show evidence that the that the the um, the expected users can use the system safely and don't have any major issues with with use in the sort of in a simulated environment or in a real use case environment and sometimes this will also be something like a new ct scanner will ask for kind of clinical clinical validation of images get some radiographers to look at the images and say yes the, these are of sufficient quality to use in a clinical setting um software verification and validation so we do a lot of software and digital health and we'll help other groups occasionally if they have a software heavy device and need a consultation, robotic systems would probably typically have a lot of software. So some, some, some devices are sort of built on a full software suite, like a software controlled diagnostic ultrasound system. We'll have an operating system, we'll have a full set of software, and we'll look at a, at a full kind of verification and validation of that software. Some devices are more firmware only, like a laser device may just have when you turn a knob, the firmware turns up the power, turns down the power, and may have a really simple touch screen. We still want to see testing of that, but it's it's at a slightly lower level. And we have some things called software as a medical device, where the whole device is a separate software. We've seen, say, detect, detection algorithms for endoscopy imaging systems. It's a separately licensed device. It's compatible with specific systems and kind of requires their images to run, but it's licensed by itself as its own device in that case. But it has to fall under the medical like device requirements. It has to treat or diagnose a device. And so there are things like decision support softwares or, or things like that, which don't necessarily fall under a medical device, but we may still get a chance to look at those depending on what level of advice they're giving or, or what how they're processing their information. And there's been an emergence of machine learning in devices. Health Canada is seeing kind of more of this predominantly in image-based applications like diagnostic imaging and radiology, sort of automatic detection of bladder volume or automatic tumor segmentation, different things like that. So machine artificial intelligence is a subfield of computer science for creating systems to perform tasks that would usually require human intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of that where the computers are designed, trained to perform tasks without explicitly programming them. And there's, there's some challenges as a regulator dealing with, with these things, how to kind of balance the safety and effectiveness of these devices while also allowing innovative products onto market and so we need to look at things like how reliable and representative is the training data that's been used will this be applicable in a real world real world scenario or is it sort of trained on very basic data and and then for for deep learning type algorithms we want to know if if this continues to learn will it continue to give the same outputs to the same inputs so these are these are tricky under our current regulations and guidelines, but it's something that Health Canada continues to work on on developing frameworks for for managing devices that use uh, machine learning. In cybersecurity, we're looking at more and more as devices are connected to networks or connected to other devices that are connected to networks. We need to know that they're designed with cybersecurity in mind and whether that's using firewalls or not connecting to networks if they don't need to or sort of having password protection or software checks to 
make sure that you know malicious acts can't can't come in and at this point um so for example medical data is regulated more by the provinces than by the federal regulators so we we can't regulate as much on whether the data in a device is safe but if if the performance of the device could be affected by cybersecurity, then we are concerned with that. Um, biocompatibility, we look at, you know, basically if, if a device is going to touch a person or go or go in, in like past the skin, breach the skin, then we need to know that it won't cause any adverse events just based on what it's made of. So ISO 10993 is the kind of typical family of standards. And it, it lays out sort of based on contact duration and based on how it, how it contacts, what tests are required. So we see in my group, a lot of skin contact for limited duration. So then there's basic, they do cytotoxicity, skin irritation kind of testing. And we'll also see a lot of manufacturers come in and say, this is made of exactly the same material as another device that's already licensed. And if we haven't seen any biocompatibility concerns based on that, then that's usually kind of sufficient to allow that to be licensed based on biocompatibility. Then clinical studies, again, is also, this is also dependent on what the intended uses are, how novel the device is. Again, to pick on an example of diagnostic ultrasound, we don't necessarily need a clinical trial for something that we understand well, but for something like, say, a cosmetic device that's sort of a novel use in the kind of specific skin treatments, we would want to see that it works if they're going to market it as something that can be used in human populations. And this can be based on literature. They, they may say this has an extremely similar profile to these devices and these have been shown to work. Or it may be an actual trial using the device. So th there's a number of ways that we can evaluate clinical trials of these devices. And there are, there are devices that get submitted for clinical trials first and that is sort of covered by Jade in the structure of the medical device regulations. I think it's the third part is the ITA devices. And then we will look at shelf life, sterilization and packaging validation. And this depends on the device. Some devices aren't sterilized, aren't meant to be sterilized and we don't get as much information on these. Some devices for surgical uses are, are shipped sterile. And so we need to look at whether their packaging can survive shipping and maintain sterility and then whether the sterilization can actually sterilize the full device because some are designed in a complicated way. So you need to make sure that the sterilization they're using will actually get all the parts of the device that need to be sterilized. And, and more so for class four devices, these are even required. And then once we've evaluated all of the safety and effectiveness, we'll come down to Approval of the device, we may just approve what they've submitted. Refusal, which is they really haven't shown that there's that the device can be safe or effective. Or a common intermediate step is a request for additional information. We'll say a lot of this is fine, but we have some questions about this. Can you give us more? And maybe they didn't include some information in their submission, or maybe they need to do more testing. And occasionally there's something called approval with conditions where We'll say this device is so new that we want to see you're, you're approved for a year, but you need to submit more data in six months and more data in a year to show that this is safe. And so those are those are the typical steps that can be taken at the end of a full review. And that's that's how we get a device to market. So with that, I we'll say thank you and any questions can be part of the question period. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for taking through such dense, dense uh, information about all the regulations. Um, if you in case you didn't see, uh, Jade did share her PowerPoint in the uh, chat box so you can grab it there um, or I've downloaded a copy so I can uh, share that with you later as well. Um, sure. I will try to do that as well if I can figure it out. <laughs> Perfect.
Uh, and I see Eric Diller has raised his hand and has got a question right off the bat. So take it away, Eric. Hi, thanks to both of you for the information. Um, so how does someone figure out what they will need to do? Because you talked about that there's an application and then there's basically more information than a decision, but that's a pretty short process. So like, how does someone know if they're gonna need clinical trial data and how extensive that'll be? And well, how does that conversation work? Um, so there are, I mean, some manufacturers will have, if, if it's a very new device, we will occasionally have what's called a pre-submission meeting where the manufacturer will make a request to have a meeting with us and they'll come in, they'll, they'll send us what they, some of the information they have and that they want to share with us at that time. And then some questions they have so we can prepare and actually kind of get through all the information in a one hour meeting. And sometimes it'll be things like that, like, do we need a clinical trial or what is this based on? And we, we can't always give them very specific answers because it does have to go through a full review process, but we can say, you know, in a device type like this, it is useful to have this information shared. And there's also, I mean, there's guidances and things on the Health Canada websites, like the regulations will say, show the, the the sort of the table of contents I gave with the sections of the submission are are from the website. Like you can sort of see what what is typically required, and yeah, I I think and and a manufacturer that sort of applied for a medical device audit program will probably have a feeling of what's required in your typical device. Yeah. Can I comment on this? Uh, just wanted to mention that uh, any uh, the investigational testing is uh, requirement is under part three of the medical devices regulations. So we have uh, what are, uh, I mean, the clinical research studies are applicable to high risk devices, twos, threes, and four. Uh, uh, I mean, up until now, we haven't seen any class one that come to investigational testing. We have started for COVID-19 devices for masks, but I don't know how we can apply masks for animals to, to I mean, to have clinical data. This is, I mean, may appear weird at first sight, but uh, we don't, we don't, uh, I mean, it's only for class two, threes, and for clinical research authorizations. And we also have, uh, uh, I mean, we, we also authorize clinical investigational uh, uh, testings for change of indication. So in the, or change of population. So in that case, the manufacturer, when they gather all the clinical data and they have uh, the investigational testing authorize, authorization issued from Health Canada, then they come for li to licensing and amend the existing license for a new indication or additional indication for use or additional population type. That's, uh, that's the way it works. It's more for high risk devices. Mm -hmm. And are, is anyone, are previous uh, approved applications published? Like we look up, or is this confidential? What do you mean? Uh, could you repeat, uh, please? Like would, would I be able to look up other applications that have been submitted and see the full application? Uh, we the, the, the yeah there is the confidentiality uh, agreement between health canada and manufacturers so there is uh, when they fill they submit manufacturers when they submit a license application there is a field where they they uh, they authorized health canada to to share the information if requested by someone or online or they, most of the time they say no, because it's a new device. They don't want to share any information. Most of the time they have seen no in the application form. So of course, yeah. for confidentiality purposes, we don't. Uh, but we have a regulatory dis summary. Could you remind me, Greg, are these summary, regulatory summary decisions, these are online? It tells you why, I mean, the safety and 
efficiency data about a licensed device. So when we have a class, it's most for class three and four. So you will find summary decision, uh, regulatory summary decision, uh, scientific data for class three and four. We may start for I think we don't have for class two because most of the time they don't go to scientific review. Yeah, I, I don't know if they do that for all devices. I know they've they've done them like, for example, you can find all of that information for all of the COVID vaccines and treatments that have been approved. They have sort of a full a full basis of decision that they published. And for I think for some novel devices, they publish these. Um, I, I th I'm. I think it. I think they want to get to the point where they're doing more of it. Of course, you know the pandemic hit and that made everything a little more complicated. But yeah, I think they'd like to get to the point where there's sort of a, at least a, a brief summary on what was what was submitted and what was approved and that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, I, that, that's helpful. Uh, in the university setting, of course, we're often working on uh, you know developing new technologies and we're not you know close to applying for um for permission but i think it would be it's always it would be important for us to know what would the regulatory um evidence that we would need to submit look like in the future if we were to you know partner with a company or commercial alliance yeah and and for example like the investigational testing that you mentioned that that's something where and it would, it would sort of be a whole a whole thing to go through its requirements, but the the shortest version is more or less that they're they're really looking at safety. So if you can show that it's safe, biocompatible, biocompatible, electrically safe, and that kind of thing, then kind of what they're testing is the effectiveness. So they submit it as we want to do a trial in X people with X devices. And usually we'll have a sponsor who the doctor or something. And, and we, we look primarily in the regulations, spell this out, we look primarily at, is it safe? And will it achieve the purposes that, that are put out in the trial? So as, far, as part of what, they, what is submitted for a trial, they'll say what, what they're looking to get and how they're looking to get it. And if it looks like their test methods will be able to give them a result, whether positive or negative, then no, those can be approved that way. So that that's something in sort of a more academic setting where yeah, the, a device might get approved to sort of lo look a little bit more at its effectiveness if it's new and not known. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Luder much. Has a question. Yes, I was just gonna say, Luder has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both uh, for for your talks. Um, and my question goes in in a similar direction than Eric's, I guess. Um, so because when when we um, yeah write grant proposals or sometimes also publications, we often get reviewer comments by saying um, you have to show that you are better than for uh, with your robot than um, like manual. Um, surgeons or, or what, what surgeons doing manually. And um, is this something what, what you or what you can agree on or what you can say, oh, this is not something what we are looking at? Um, of course, sometimes in like asking for an uh, REB or so, that might be tricky um, to say that it will take longer in time, for example, or um, the, the robot will not work each time when you set it up or, or something like that. But yeah, it, is that something what, what you, when you're looking to on a product level also look at, or could it also be just advanced um, user, um, yeah, user um, um, capability, or that that the that the user is a surgeon likes the system better than just the the manual tools than than the robot. Um, I mean, we don't 
I don't think we evaluate something based on its performance compared to something else unless it's unless it is something like a safety like if something's less safe then we may want to look at why or if it's shown to be more safe but we if a manufacturer presents something uh, as comparable to another device then we'll look at the comparisons and sort of on a technical level and and like how that makes it safe or effective but ultimately it comes down to if if it's safe or effective on it in its own rights whether it like we we don't look at for example whether a device is cheaper or more expensive than another device that doesn't come into our applications um we whether it takes longer or not unless unless the taking longer would have a significant effect on the safety for example uh, of a device but I haven't seen particular kind of requirements for that and that, that might go into something like usability testing where we'll say you know was this tested for usability and again that will primarily show up like did did this cause problems for the users trying to use this new device and should it have been redesigned basically are you know are there too many buttons too close together and somebody's going to hit hit the wrong button that's going to make something happen that shouldn't happen at the wrong time so i don't know if that's exactly answering your question but yeah in in terms of comparing to other devices it it depends and, and we'll we'll look for evidence sometimes if if it's an if it's a novel device type we'll, we might go do independent research even through through literature and say does this exist and to a point or then we may or we may ask the manufacturer to say you know can you show other similar devices that are able to achieve what you say this device can achieve or or give us clinical data or you know there there there's different ways to to approach it and but sort of once they meet the kind of safe and effective baseline then we kind of go go from there i guess and, and is there a threshold for effectiveness so because of, like what you what you also said in terms of um, machine learning algorithms right so they could be not as good as an experienced surgeon or an experienced radiologist, but um, still be better than maybe a bunch of other experts. Yeah, and I guess, yeah, I guess that that would depend on its intended use. So if 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 something is meant, if a machine learning thing is meant to help in a decision support with for an in an inexperienced user, for example, then if it's be significantly better than the inexperienced user then that may be a high enough effectiveness i guess there's not a line in the sand it kind of depends on on what benefits it's giving on whether there are risks to it i mean there's there's risks with say machine learning where people will start to rely too much on the output of the machine learning algorithm and so so then it will often have to have say the labeling clearly spell out how how the algorithms arriving at its decision what the what this sort of sensitivity and specificity are what kind of inputs it expects and and how you know how how it'll present the answer like if it gives a probability versus a hard and fast answer and that so yeah there, there's it it's really device dependent and safety dependent and yeah, it sort of wrap, wraps up that risk benefit with safety and effectiveness so yeah it it depend it depends on on the profile of the device in a lot of ways yeah uh, can you comment on this please yeah. It, yeah just to let you know that the licensing requirements focuses on the device itself not on its comparison with other devices. So if you have a class three or a class four device, you are required to submit these clinical data, the scientific, you don't have to compare it unless, unless requested by Health Canada. And all the scientific data, it, they come by through summary reports, which means you write things as, 
I think like they are making summaries of the clinical data. They don't just submit the, the, the I mean, uh, what we, how do we name these uh, reports? They have to gather all the data. They don't have to submit document. I mean, from each uh, the REB approval, or they have to make a summary to make it to make the process more streamlined and much easier for health health can the scientific reviewer to look at the data and uh, it's time saving and uh, then looking at each paper to make a regulatory decision. That's the way it works, Greg. I mean, from what I have seen. Yeah, I mean, we we have a, yeah, we will sometimes see summaries. We'll sometimes see a lot of extremely detailed reports. I mean, the summaries are generally helpful. So, some, and yeah, and again, it depends on the device. If it's something that we understand well, then then it the summaries can be a little easier. If it's something where we need to dig in a little deeper to the evidence, then we may ask for more detailed reports, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. No problem. Great. Um, and we did have a, a question, a detailed question from Sherbin in the chat box. Uh, is there an equivalent of 510K pathway in FDA? Uh, I can. I can answer this question and you can go ahead. Yeah, so the 510K is a pre-market notification for the US FDA. It's equivalent uh, for Health Canada is a licensing pathway. So the US FDA issues a 510K for class two, three, and four. Health Canada issues a license for a class two, three, and four. It's just the naming. So just nomenclature, Sherbin. Um, great. Did you have something to add? Um, no, I, I think, yeah, I haven't dug a ton into 510Ks. I know they're, that they will occasionally use a little bit more um, predicate-based stuff with 510K. They'll say this is substantially equivalent to a previous device, whereas we, we will take that as part of the evidence, but usually still we'll have to kind of do a full review of all the rest of the evidence. But so that's that's the one small difference I've seen between ours and and theirs is that and you know, sometimes it's it's a shorter decision for theirs where they'll say the technical characteristics appear similar enough to this other device. So yeah. Great. Oh, Sherbin, did you have a comment? Yeah, so thank you very much. So in Canada, it's a longer process, even though there is established equivalent uh, device already there. So we should go through all the regulatory process, right? Yeah, and and yeah, and that, and that depends on risk class. I mean, the class twos have a fairly short path, as Jade said. I think it's fifteen days, and then, but the class threes and fours kind of, you know, require like we'll we'll get anywhere from 500 to 10,000 pages worth of documents to sift through and write a report on and kind of determine which information is critical and and sometimes have to go back and ask for even more information after the fact, even in the very lengthy uh, submission. So yeah, it, it's dependent, it depends on the risk class basically on how long things take. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh just wanted to add one comment. This is a good question. Uh, it, it's a longer process, even if we talk about 15 days for class two, but sometimes a file may uh, be with us for three or four months because we, we always go back to the manufacturers and ask for the missing information and they don't always have it and the most issue with uh, the most stringent pro the, the the process yeah is uh, stringent especially for uh, small businesses uh, of class two devices so because we request the quality management certificate which is the iso 13485 we which is which cost a lot of money. It can go up to $50,000 for an electrical toothbrush, which is a class two device. So you can imagine for a small business, how can they, they deal with this? With an ISO certificate for a 
risk device, medium risk device, which are class two devices. Uh, they do understand it for high risk devices, class threes and four, but for class two is, it is considered as a regulatory burden for small businesses. In addition to knowing that the, yeah, the process is long if the manufacturer don't comply with our regulatory uh, requirements. These are all great things to be aware of. Certainly, thank you. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Are there any uh, last questions that anybody would like to ask? Please feel free to put your mic on and ask or type it in the chat. I did put my presentation into the chat as well, which hopefully works too. Great. Yeah, thank you for sharing thank those. You. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for all of this great information. I know that our students, the ones who could be here today and the ones who could not, uh, are going to really appreciate it. And, and I thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone. No problem. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank Have you. a good afternoon. You too. Bye. Bye.